And JP Morgan Chase suggests that the market share of precious metals and precious metals investments in the U.S. market, where JP Morgan Chase can track it, is estimated to be below one half of 1%, which is to say, wow. suggest that less, of, less than one half of 1% of all savings and investment assets uh, in the United States are combined, uh, are, pardon me, comprised of precious metals and precious metals related investments. What's interesting about their statistics is that they theorize that the four decade mean market share was 2%. So if you merely revert to mean, demand for precious metals increases fourfold in the largest savings and investment market in the world. To put that in context, the U.S. market controls between 22 and 23 percent of savings and investment assets on the globe, including foreign investments in the United States. If you had reversion to mean, you would see a quadrupling in demand in a market that comprises between 22 and 23% of the total market for savings and investment assets on the planet. That's precisely what I think is gonna happen, which is one of the reasons why I'm so bullish about gold and silver. Rick Rule unpacks why top US banks confirm gold's undervaluation, citing central bank purchases as the driving force behind its surge. Despite lackluster interest from generalist investors, Rule notes a growing attraction to gold among younger demographics. With data from J.P. Morgan Chase indicating precious metals market share below half a percent in the U.S., Rule anticipates a significant demand increase if the market reverts to its four-decade mean. Uh, the first is that the increase that you've seen in the gold price hasn't come from retail buying. Uh, in fact, if you look statistically at the precious metals ETFs, what you've seen is retail selling uh, in yes. Europe and the United States. The buying has taken place by central banks. And I think that's the, the key reason why the gold stocks haven't moved. Central banks don't buy gold stocks. They buy gold. If you begin to overlay retail buying on the central bank buying that you've seen uh, over the last two years, then I think you see an explosive move in the gold price. And I think at that point in time, it probably carries through to the stocks too. The second comment that I have for you is that the generalist investor still can't spell gold. <laughs> they don't care. They think that in uh, an inflationary period, that they do better uh, with technology companies that have high operating margins, that the best cure, that the best, uh, you know, uh, guard against inflation is a hugely profitable business. There's some truth to that. You know, Buffett did extraordinarily well through the decade of the 70s uh, by focusing on companies that had pricing power. Uh, and I don't discourage people from looking at that. But I also do think that people need to pay much more attention to uh, inflation protection that is easy to understand. <laughs> the yeah. difference between gold <laughs> and, and, say, NVIDIA uh, is that it's pretty easy to pronounce and understand gold. And NVIDIA, I just hope I got right. The third comment I would have, uh, however, is that interest in gold among young people uh, and non-traditional people is increasing very rapidly. At my own site, Rule Investment Media, I'm getting an average of 40 new subscribers a day. And they aren't the old... <laughs> old, bald, fat, white, uh, God, guns, and gold crowd. Uh, the new audience is at least 35% female and more than 50% non-North American. So I think it's important that the gold industry and the gold mining industry begin to address new audiences. Uh, I think that's very important. What you'll find is that interest among people under the age of 40 in gold and silver is explosively high measured by my own database. And JP Morgan Chase suggests that the market share of precious metals and precious metals investments in the US market, where JP Morgan Chase can track it, is estimated to be below one half of 1%, which is to say, wow. suggest that less, of, less than one half of 1% of all savings and investment assets uh, in the United States are combined, uh, are, pardon me, comprised of precious metals and precious metals related investments. 
What's interesting about their statistics is that they theorize that the four decade mean market share was 2%. So if you merely revert to mean, demand for precious metals increases fourfold in the largest savings and investment market in the world. To put that in context, the US market controls between 22 and 23% of savings and investment assets on the globe, including foreign investments in the United States. If you had reversion to mean, you would see a quadrupling in demand in a market that comprises between 22 and 23% of the total market for savings and investment assets on the planet. That's precisely what I think is going to happen, which is one of the reasons why I'm so bullish about gold and silver. Continuing the discussion, Rick Rule delves into the impact of fear on precious metals prices emphasizing investors' concern over fiat currency depreciation as a key driver. He highlights how geopolitical tensions, like war threats, serve as psychological triggers for investors already wary of financial instability. Rule then delves into the consequences of governments printing currency to fund wars, likening it to counterfeiting and devaluing existing currency. Drawing a comparison to Picasso's counterfeit drawings, Rule challenges the distinction between quantitative easing and counterfeiting, suggesting that the true value lies in scarcity and provenance. In my experience, the immediate impact uh, of a, very, a, a variety of fears could impact the precious metals price. Um, looking at history, the most important variable is the one that you track which is to say the fear that savers and investors have about the maintenance of their purchasing power in fiat currencies. In the very near term, I think what happens, I think I've observed this over 50 years being involved with investors, is that as investors begin to feel the fear associated with the deterioration of their purchasing power, they use any psychological excuse to express that fear. And so war or the threat of war becomes the excuse to exercise a strategy that they were already considering as a consequence of financial fears. Now, the second part of your statement is very profound. The uh, want of societies around the world to exercise their political will, given the unwillingness of their own citizens to pay for it, means that they have to borrow or they have to print to wage these wars. Uh, printing new specious currency units without doing anything to increase the underlying value of the economy uh, always, always undermines the value of the existing currency units. If you have, let's say, a trillion currency units, call it what you want. Let's call them mics just for fun. And Mike decides that he's going to print uh, 200 million, or pardon me, 200 billion more mics to keep the trillion already in existence company without doing anything to increase Mike's net worth uh, or uh, his income or the utility he generates. What he's done is basically devalued the existing stock by the amount that he's added. And there's no particular difference between a Mike and a dollar. <laughs> you know, they're both specious currency units. The difference, yeah. I guess, is that the, you know, the, the dollar uh, has an army and a navy behind it, and Mike is somewhat more peaceful, but that's, that's the only difference. I challenge any of your um, uh, listeners to explain to me how quantitative easing isn't counterfeiting, other than who does it. Uh, that brings up another uh, topic about scarcity and value. You know, Pablo Picasso used to, on occasion, go to a restaurant, look at the bill, get a piece of paper, and draw a Picasso, <laughs> a currency. So let's say that the meal was 50 francs. Uh, he would draw a 50 Picasso franc thing on a piece of paper and give that to the restaurant owner in lieu of 50 francs. And the understanding that I have is that those uh, counterfeit Picassos uh, are worth uh, an average of a thousand times <laughs> what the face value 
of that was. So in some senses, depending on the provenance of the issue, or you're better off <laughs> with the counterfeit than you would be with the real. Today's discussion with Rick Rule provided valuable insights into the dynamics shaping the gold market. We learned that the recent surge in gold prices is attributed more to central bank buying than retail demand, which could signal a potential explosive move in the future. Rick also highlighted the increasing interest in gold among young and diverse demographics, indicating a shifting landscape in the industry. Furthermore, he emphasized the role of fear, geopolitical tensions, and currency devaluation in driving precious metals prices. As we conclude, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share your thoughts in the comments below.